Uh, thanks for being here. I am Regina Gia, the president of the Garden State Initiative, and we are grateful for you to be here and excited about what we think will be a really interesting panel. Um, we've brought together uh, a group of individuals who would bring both academic as well as operational perspectives, New York and New Jersey, um, roads and bridges, as well as mass transit. So uh, we're looking forward to the discussion for the next uh, hour or so. Uh, we're going to use a Q&A format. Uh, we've gotten some cues in from individuals who uh, have uh, sent them in beforehand. But uh, what we're going to do is leave everybody on mute, if you would, and use the chat function for a Q&A um, so that we can uh, you know, keep it, the flow going. And uh, as a reminder for everyone, uh, this session is being recorded. And uh, there are members of the press uh, that are expected to join us today. So uh, with that uh, understanding, I wanted to, you know, uh, get started. Um, I'm going to introduce each panelist and let them make a few remarks, uh, you know, address the audience for a minute or two. And then, as I said, we're going to go into the Q&A um, format that, and I'll be moderating it. Uh, so first up, I'm going to introduce uh, former Commissioner Jim Simpson, and he's currently the chairman of Victory Worldwide Transportation. He's also a former DOT commissioner uh, under Governor Christie, as well as the former head of the Federal Transit Administration under President George Bush. Jim was appointed uh, also by Governor Pataki to serve on the board of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, and he served there for 10 years. Um, he holds a bachelor's degree from St. John's University in managerial science and economics. So he brings a wealth of perspective. So welcome, Jim, and um, go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. It's, it's great to be here. It's uh, great to be remembered. It's been six and a half years since I left public service, and I miss it deeply. Um, I'd like to begin by my remarks are going to be about the region. I'm not going to talk specifically about Jersey Transit, but it's really the region, the tri-state area, which is a real big megalopolis. So what impacts us impacts New York MTA and, and, and so forth. I'm not a futurist. But I, I kind of think to steal a term from Richard Florida, this might be a great reset in terms of where we live, how we live, how we work, where we work, when we work, and most importantly, what kinds of services the local, state, and federal governments are going to be uh, able to deliver down, down the road. I see it in my own business. We move people around the world. Um, people are moving at, right now, and corporations have stopped relocating people because they want to really get a sense of what's going on with the pandemic. Also, I'm a little concerned. I don't believe with respect to the services that government delivers that we felt the financial impacts of COVID or reductions in services or reductions in scheduling if it were transit, uh, mostly because the federal stimulus, both the past that's now going to kick in and talk of future stimuluses have given a lifeline, and in some cases to the private sector, uh, but also to states and local governments. I know from my own experience, both on the federal level and the state level, We've always looked to uh, the federal government for help and historically we've always gotten it. Um, uh, this is two months old, this news, but according to Forbes, there are only five states that have taken the pandemic seriously with respect to their finances. And those states are Idaho, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Florida, and Texas. And not surprisingly, our own statistics, Florida and Texas are the two most inbound states where everybody is moving because of lower taxes. And unfortunately, the two biggest outbound states where me, people are moving from are New York and New Jersey. So it doesn't bode well for the tax base and going future. Drilling down to transportation, transportation planning, particularly for any kind of projects, new projects, or even, even uh, rolling stock and such takes years of capital and operating plans. So projects that look good five years ago may go to shovel, go to shovel tomorrow morning. Uh, I think because of everything that's hit us, and for me, uh, look, I'm not an economist and I can't tell you for sure, but for me, the short run with this pandemic is gonna be five years because of a whole host of reasons that maybe we can get into later. But my point is in New Jersey, it's not just New Jersey transit, but the Turnpike Authority really needs to look at their capital and operating budgets, the DOT, the Port Authority, all of the agencies need to look at their, um, uh, at their budgets. And lastly, these, these decisions go way above the boards of transit agencies or the commissioners of DOT. Unfortunately, these decisions go, they're at the cabinet level or at the governor's level on the state level or at the mayor's level on a city level. And there's no shortage of, uh, of problems. There is a shortage of solutions, however. So 
let's see. The good news is we're all in this together. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, next, I'll introduce uh, Senator Bob Gordon. Um, he was confirmed as a member of the New Jersey Transit Board of Directors on January 13th in 2020. He also serves as one of five commissioners of the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities, which he joined in April of 2018. <coughs> Senator Gordon has served more than 14 years in the legislature, 10 of those in the Senate, where he attained the positions of majority conference leader and chairman of the Senate Transportation Committee, the Legislative Manufacturing Caucus, and the Senate Legislative Oversight Committee. While chairman of the latter, the former uh, Senator uh, Gordon conducted extensive investigatory hearings on deficiencies at New Jersey Transit. So he brings a wealth of perspective, both uh, as you can hear from the legislative as well as the board and the BPU as well as transit. So welcome, Senator. Uh, thank you, Regina. It's, it's, it's great to be here with all of you. Um, let me uh, begin with the, the standard disclaimer that uh, anything I, I say today are my own views and I'm not speaking for New Jersey Transit or the, for that matter, the Board of Public Utilities. Um, uh, this morning, Regina had suggested that I, I talk about uh, what I consider some of the major priorities facing transportation leaders in New Jersey. Um, and while the, um, I think the many of us are thinking about uh, how we deal with the, the, the pandemic, uh, these priorities were important to me uh, before the, the virus uh, struck our country. Um, I would say first and, and foremost, we need to develop a, a stable, dedicated source of funding long-term for New Jersey Transit's operating budget. Unless we can put that in place all the things that we want to do for, for transit, my remarks are going to focus mainly on transit. All the things we want to do to try to improve that organization can be very challenging. Um, if you look at our, our, our peer organizations like, like SEPTA, Chicago Transit Authority, Los Angeles uh, Transit Authority, the, the, the Boston agency, they all rely on a dedicated funding source that accounts for about 50% of their operating budget. In New Jersey, in contrast, we uh, have to deal with the vagaries of the annual budget process. Uh, the operating budget changes from year to year, from administration to administration, and uh, that makes long-term planning extraordinarily difficult. And for uh, at least the last 10 years, what has happened is um, every year there has been a transfer of about 400 to $500 million from the capital budget to the operating budget to, uh, to meet current expenses. And I believe, I think most, most observers would agree that that has had a devastating impact on our infrastructure and the quality of our, of our service. Um, but uh, things have changed. If you'll for, uh, allow me to just make a uh, sort of a shout out to my team. Uh, with the arrival of Governor Murphy, um, the restoration of New Jersey Transit became a, a major priority and we've made some major investments in, in infrastructure. We're buying new rail cars, 200 buses, new, new locomotives. We're moving forward with, with new garages. Uh, we're, we're replacing the Raritan Bridge, the Portal Bridge, uh, making investments in the Hoboken Station and on the operations side, investing in, in, in IT, uh, uh, filling uh, critical staffing positions and uh, uh, re-engineering critical business uh, processes. But I would argue to maintain the momentum that we've developed and to get where we need to be, we need a new dedicated source, a stable source of long-term funding for operating budget. Now I have three other priorities that I'd like to just throw out there. Um, I believe we need to expand ferry service along the Hudson um, you know, I don't think we take advantage uh, of ferries as much as we can. I mean, you look at uh, cities like Baltimore, they have a uh, regular ferry service along the harbor. And I think we should link it to an expanded Hudson Bergen light rail system that will link Englewood with Weehawken and give people a 30 minute ride to the, the ferry docks in Weehawken. Uh, I also believe we need to make, uh, we need to continue to invest in our bus service, especially intrastate bus service, which we have found uh, uh, is, is critical to those uh, uh, essential workers. 
And uh, it's important to maintain the, the, the flexibility of, of bus routes as we figure out how uh, work patterns and commuting patterns are, are changing. And uh, for that matter, we need to uh, uh, devote some effort to redesigning bus networks um, as, as part of that. And I can point out that uh, we just announced that we are undertaking such a, a process in Newark. Finally, I believe we need to press ahead with the construction of the new Port Authority bus terminal in Midtown Manhattan. And I respectfully suggest that we name it the Senator Loretta Weinberg Transportation Center. Thank you. Thanks, Senator. Appreciate that. That was a, that was a lot. So we'll get to chew on a lot of that, I think, as we go, uh, go forward. Okay, next I wanted to introduce uh, Nicole Galinas. Uh, Nicole is a uh, senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, a contributing editor of City Journal and a columnist for the New York Post. Her areas of expertise include public transportation and infrastructure and public transportation and public transportation. Uh, Ms. Galinas has uh, published analyses and opinion pieces in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times and other publications. She holds a BA in English Literature from Tulane University. We're really glad to have you with us, Nicole. Good morning, thank you, Regina. And it's nice to be with all of you this morning. I'm here in Midtown Manhattan, where it is pretty much empty. I watched everyone flee Midtown almost a year ago, and I figured this is the best place in the world if you wanna socially distance and be by yourself is right here in the heart of the tri-state region. And, you know, I say that kind of jokingly, but things really haven't started to improve in, in terms of foot traffic at all. You know, their statistics show that fewer than 20% of office workers have gone back to their offices. That is certainly true if you are walking around here. We got a little bit of, of regional Christmas tourism and maybe a few dozen people uh, every hour going out to look at the Christmas tree and the Christmas lights. But since that is gone, we are probably close to back at the foot, track, foot traffic of last April or last May. And that's pretty devastating, not only for New York City's economy in the near term, but also for the tri-state economy. If you think about the 60 year business model, not only for New York City, but for uh, Northern New Jersey, for Southern Connecticut and for Long Island and Westchester, it has been pack white collar jobs into the core of Manhattan below 60th Street, 60th Street, and then use mass transit to bring people to those jobs every day and send them home at the end of the day. So if you think about Manhattan below 60th Street, has 100 or had before the pandemic, 150,000 jobs per square mile. It had, uh, you know, even though Manhattan has only 20% of the city's population, it had 40% of the city's retail jobs, had a disproportionate share of white collar and six figure jobs. And this only works if mass transit works. So every day, almost 4 million people would come onto the island of Manhattan, go home at the end of the day. Uh, 600,000 of those 4 million daily Manhattan commuters were from New Jersey, on New Jersey transit, on trains, on buses, and on the PATH station. So unless we figure out a way to get people comfortably back onto mass transit, including New Jersey transit and in the other uh, New Jersey transportation options, we're not going to rebuild Manhattan's economy anything close to what it looked like before the pandemic. And that harms not only the city, but the region, because this is the, the, Manhattan has been the dense wealth creator where people come into the core of the city, take their money home with them and spend it at home, whether in New Jersey or in, in the other suburbs or other city boroughs. So what are some of the things that we need to think about in terms of can and should we rebuild the core of the city by recommitting to transit? Are people going to work at home forever? Probably not five days a week. I don't think people are happy sitting in their bedrooms five days a week and, and not, uh, not seeing their colleagues, their clients, their vendors, but are they going to go back to a five day a week uh, commute? Probably not either. I think it's going to settle into something where people go to work two to three days a week, work at home the other two to three days. Maybe you schedule your internal meetings 
one day a week, your external meetings, the other day a week, you go in for those two days and you do your work at home, the balance of that time. What will it convince, what will it take to convince people to try going back to the office again? That depends on transit. And I think we have to start thinking about transit, not in a utilitarian way, but as an amenity. The days where people pack themselves on to crowded buses and trains, where they don't even have room to sit down, they're crammed up against strangers, they're waiting at the Port Authority bus terminal during a, a weather event, or they're waiting at Penn Station because the trains are delayed again. Those days are over. People are not going to put up with their pre-pandemic commutes. If they try to go back to the office this fall and they are met with a low quality of commute, they will go back to working at home. They'll say, this isn't <laughs> worth it for me. And their employers will say, it's not worth it for us either because our employees are more productive when they're happy. So to have any chance of rebuilding what we had before the pandemic, again, it starts with mass transit and it starts in being in a counterintuitive position of having to provide a better quality of transit with less fiscal resources. Terrific. Thanks, Nicole. That's great. Yeah, nice broad perspective and uh, love that you're bringing in kind of because a lot of obviously people who are on this call and New Jersey all experience a lot of what you're describing. So I know they can they can relate to that. And we'll come back to that as we go through the Q&A. So our final panelist I want to introduce is uh, John Carnegie. Uh, John is the executive director of the Alan Voorhees Transportation Center at Rutgers University here in New Jersey. And he's an adjunct member of the faculty at the Blaustein School of Planning and Policy, Public Policy. Uh, John has more than 25 years of experience at the municipal, county, and regional level. His expertise includes transportation, land use, and environmental planning and policy, mobility management, multimodal systems planning, and travel behavior, public engagement, environmental justice, and equity issues related to traditionally underserved populations. Mr. Carnegie holds a BA and a master's of city and regional planning degree from Rutgers University. Welcome, John. Oh, thank you very much. It's a, a pleasure to be here with uh, this esteemed panel. Um, and uh, uh, I'm happy to kind of share my thoughts about uh, where we are in the pandemic and, and what's ahead of us. Um, it's certainly an interesting and, and challenging time uh, I think uh, Jim suggested that uh, transportation decision making um, is a years long process and we're, uh, we're stuck right in the middle of needing to figure things out in a matter of months. Um, so just the, the singular challenge of adapting our, uh, our, our planning processes to, to deal with a very dynamic situation has been, uh, you know, uh, something that has been vexing for many uh, transportation agencies. We, we think in decades, right? We do 2040, 2050, 2060 plans, not uh, you know, figuring out on the fly how to provide the best service available. Uh, the Voorhees Transportation Center, since, um, uh, since the pandemic, we've been uh, focused on, on kind of documenting how mobility uh, in the region and elsewhere in the country has changed. And, and more importantly, kind of thinking through how uh, pandemic induced behavior changes may impact mobility in the nearer and longer term um, and how those changes you know impact policy and, and planning decision making so uh, uh, you know our mission is really to to understand problems um, provide information and inform decisions and uh, we've been doing that in, in a couple of different ways that have uh, I think made it clear to me that that uh, that, that we definitely have um, uh, changing circumstances around us. Um, there, I think, will be some resetting of the relationship between uh, people, work, and how we get around. Um, uh, I think in many ways, the pandemic accelerated trends that were already in the works uh, in terms of the relationship we have to teleworking and uh, uh, e-commerce and telemedicine and, and things like that. And if anything, um, it forced us to get better at doing those things. Um, and getting more comfortable doing those things. So uh, I do believe there will be a, a sort of change in, in the, uh, the level of travel and the times we travel and things like that. Um, I don't believe there will be a, a fundamental shift away from 
uh, cities because uh, cities have been attractive over the millennia for many, many reasons. Um, and we need to come together to, to uh, support economic activity and uh, innovation and things like that. So I, I think that um, there may be a recalibration of, um, of that relationship between people and central headquarter locations perhaps. Um, but I think that the region, our region itself um, is, is gonna ultimately still remain pretty attractive to, uh, to economic growth. Um, uh, New York City will uh, be reborn, I think, in, in maybe a slightly different way, but um, will still be an amazing international city. Um, so figuring out how we deal with the transportation challenges that existed before the pandemic, um, as well as the new challenges, is you know the equation we're trying to figure out. Um, I don't think anyone has the answers at this point. Um, I think that uh, things like transportation funding, the backlog of deferred maintenance on our legacy infrastructure systems and safety and capacity constraints into and out of Manhattan and uh, greenhouse gas emissions and all of those challenges, um, may, we may have hit a, a slight pause in having to grapple with those, um, but we will in the, I think in the near term kind of, uh, if you think about the near term in the three to five year frame, we'll need to be dealing with those things as well. Uh, in the shorter term, uh, one of the biggest challenges I think we face, and it's really wrapped up in, in how well we'll be able to face those, those uh, uh, challenges that existed pre-pandemic is convincing people that transit is safe to use. Um, and uh, the research that I've seen uh, indicates that we're not doing a good job of that, that, uh, that uh, the, the uh, sort of self-reported feeling people had about transit and use of even shared mobility like um, Uber and Lyft and transportation network companies. The fear that people had back in March is the, the same feeling they have now um, about, uh, about the safety of using public transit. So um, I think that there, that there is evidence that uh, transit isn't necessarily uh, as dangerous activity as people think it is. Um, some of this may change with the, vaccine, with the vaccines and such, but convincing people that it's okay to use public transit um, is gonna be one of the critical things we have to do in the next uh, probably year to two years. Um, and I think another thing that is gonna be a big challenge for us is to, to sort of get out of our, and, and perhaps the pandemic provides an opportunity for us to do that. And there's some evidence that I, I've seen of this in, in New Jersey and. Um, and elsewhere, uh, giving us an opportunity to kind of rethink the services we do provide as uh, public uh, transit agencies um, and uh, how we spend the, the resources we already have um, and thinking through how the new, uh, new service patterns and uh, a refocusing on our customers. And like Nicole said, sort of thinking of transit in a different way in this new uh, construct of relationship between people, work, economic activity, and travel, um, I think is a great opportunity for us to, to, uh, to fix some of the long-term issues we had with, with uh, equity issues, with the way uh, public transit services were, were provided and how we serve many of the communities that are not Manhattan uh, in New Jersey and the other suburbs around New York. Um, this is a great opportunity for us to rethink, rethink that, perhaps right-size the services that we are providing um, in terms of the times of day and the, and the overall uh, amount of service in a way that is actually ultimately better for uh, economic activity, society, and, and everyone that it serves. Right. Great job, thank you. Actually, that's a great jumping off point because um, the first question uh, that we were gonna um, put to the panel, we're gonna start with Nicole, um, is really about some of the issues you were just raising at the end. So we'll begin with um, you know, a question we get from a variety of you know, angles, but I'll state it like this. Uh, mass transit and transportation agencies have seen dramatic decreases in fare box and toll revenue in the last year, leaving I know obvious and large deficits. While there certainly will be some recoveries we've just been talking about, what can be done though to reorient operating costs until that revenue stabilizes? And then one, actually one of our audience members put it, you know, is this a crisis or an opportunity? So Nicole, I'll let you start. 
Yeah, I think the answer is yes, it's it's both. And in, in saying that we certainly don't want to minimize the uh, the, the contribution and the, the uh, tremendous uh, uh, sacrifice that the transit workers have made, particularly on the New York City transit side over the past year. But for the moment, transit agencies, whether it's the MTA, New Jersey Transit, PATH system, the Port Authority, really depending on federal rescue funds and not in a long-term strategic manner, but you know the CARES Act offered money for transit to tide them through through the end of 2020. And then the Rescue Act that the former president signed in, in, in December uh, signed another package to tide them through through most of this year, 2021. So for the most part, that money takes care of the immediate operating deficits. But I think you're right, the, 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 uh, the, the operating budget challenges are going to last well more through the end of 2021. So the risk for these transit agencies is once the rest of the country has moved on, once the federal government has forgotten about us, what do we do with these structural budget deficits that we haven't addressed? So we should be taking this time to think about how do we rationalize some of these operating costs? And that way, if you do it gradually, you don't have to have traumatic layoffs. You don't have to have traumatic service cuts. So what should some of the agencies be thinking about in terms of operating costs? The healthcare costs, particularly for retirees who retire before the age where they're eligible for Medicare costs. I mean, the MTA is spending $2 billion a year on healthcare. Should, should these uh, agencies have a codicil in all of their union agreements starting now, that if we do get a public option at the federal level, that all of these retiree liabilities are released, that if the public option safety net is good enough for everybody else, it should be good enough for public sector retirees. And in cities like Detroit, Chicago have begun doing that in transferring younger retirees to the Obamacare exchanges. I mean, this is, we have to start thinking about is retiree healthcare liability, is that something that a state level agency can shoulder? No private sector employer shoulders the burden of retiree health care liability anymore. That's why we have Medicare. And the, at the federal level, we have decided that this is something that the federal government should do after the age of 65. So why is it that these agencies are still stuck with that liability? I think that's something that we're going to have to consider. And things like do we need conductors going up every single commuter train and checking each ticket manually? Or should we go to a gated ticketing system on the commuter rails, just like Europe and developed Asia have, where the conductor ticketing is spot check. So they may check one out of every 20 people for a ticket. You know, you can do this based on random seating. So there's no racial or gender profiling. And if you haven't paid your ticket, you pay a $250 fine, a big deterrence to not having your ticket. So, and another thing is two person train operation on, on the subway system side. Do you need two people on every subway train or can you use automation to go down to one person? Again, don't have to do this with layoffs all at once. You could phase these changes in over five years, even over 10 years, but you're in a much better position coming out of this in, in 2024, 2025, if we start to think of some of these union concessions and some of these long-term liabilities now, rather than wait until 2025 and see, we've still only got 60% of our ridership and we're not getting any more federal rescue funds. And so we have to make all of these traumatic cuts all at once and send away what's left of the ridership. Okay, good, thanks. Thanks, Nicole. Bob, would you like to make any comments? Yeah, um, you know, first of all, I I, uh, I think Nicole makes a number of good points, and um, I would say that actually, from what I've seen during my short stay at, at, at New Jersey Transit, we are undertaking a number of the uh, suggestions that that Nicole made. Um, you know, obviously, uh, more fundamental changes re require some discussion at the collective bargaining table. Um, 
but uh, you know, when the, uh, the new administration came in, um, the governor called for a comprehensive management audit of the organization. An organization called North Highland came in, looked at all the critical business processes, procurement, IT, recruiting, uh, found as I think we all uh, suspected a, a kind of an archaic process, a lot of, a lot of paper moving around. And uh, in, the, in recent months, we've been making major investments in IT and software and apps for our customers, uh, contactless uh, fare uh, collection, um, and, and working on these internal processes to achieve the efficiencies that I think you know, should be step one uh, before we start you know, restructuring the organization. But I, you know, I think we're moving in the right direction. Great. Great. Um, we're starting to get a lot of questions in. So if you don't mind, I'm actually going to go on to the next question and keep it moving along. And, and Bob, you're actually going to get to answer this one first, and then we'll go on to Jim and John. Um, so, um, and it's got to do with, um, you know, the funding you actually mentioned in your opening remarks, Bob. So, it, you know, declining car co commuters uh, using gas, um, you know, vehicles triggered a gas tax increase last fall. The gradual move to electric presents similar issues. What responsible steps can New Jersey take to stabilize transportation funding and acknowledge the public's interest in sustainable energy? And uh, one of the viewers added as well, and could you, you know, what do you think about monetizing assets? And do you see that coming back into something under consideration? So we'll start with you, Bob. Okay, well, uh, thanks for that, that question. Um, you know, I actually had the, uh, the benefit of being in the the Senate when uh, Senator Sarlo and Senator Araujo were developing the, the gas tax uh, legislation in, in 2016. And I don't think they or really any of us thought about the potential impact of uh, the growth of electric vehicles on uh, gas tax revenues. And we certainly didn't think about the impact of a, a pandemic. But uh, clearly um, electric vehicles are, are in our future. If I could just give you a, a say a few words about what's been going on in New Jersey there. Uh, we're, uh, we're expecting a major growth in the, the population of electric vehicles. It is um, an area of focus because transportation uh, accounts for nearly half of greenhouse gases uh, in the state and certainly is a major source of, of respiratory illness, particularly in, in urban areas. And so uh, shortly after the governor took office, um, uh, he called for, he established new goals of, uh, for um, the electric vehicle population, 330,000 light duty vehicles by 2025, a very aggressive goal. Uh, legislation was approved that requires New Jersey Transit to electrify 10% of its uh, new bus purchases by 2024. We're installing uh, charging infrastructure in, in four of our garages. Um, the state energy master plan places much, uh, much emphasis on um, electric vehicles. And, um, and the BPU actually is, uh, has um, developed a plan uh, calling for the joint development between utilities and private investors in a in statewide charging infrastructure. And in fact, tomorrow morning, uh, the board will be uh, taking action on, on one utilities proposal. And we're, we're likely to uh, issue a, our plans for medium and heavy duty vehicles. So Bottom line is electric vehicles are going to become a major factor. And that prompts the question, what do we do about uh, the disappearing gas tax revenue? Well, uh, I can tell you that as a, a member of the uh, EV committee of the uh, National Organization for Regulatory uh, uh, Commissioners, uh, Utility Commissioners, uh, this is something that every state is dealing with. I'm not sure anyone has the answer yet, uh, but a number of, of proposals are out there. I thought just for the benefit of the listeners, I'll, I'll throw out some of the ideas that have been, um, have been proposed, uh, none of which I think is under serious discussion in New Jersey. Uh, but some states, uh, including those in the um, I-95 coalition um, in the Mid-Atlantic are exploring the idea of replacing the, the gas tax with a tax on vehicle miles traveled. Um, other states, such as Washington State are considering a, a surcharge on vehicle registrations annually with the revenue dedicated to transportation funding. Uh, another idea is to um, 
uh, calls for a small fee on uh, at the time of purchase uh, based on sticker price. Uh, and given the fact that uh, many states exempt electric vehicles from sales tax and the federal government provides a, 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 um, a tax credit of several thousand dollars that um, that fee is not expected to be onerous and yet might generate a good deal of revenue. Um, there's also been some talk about developing a, a surcharge for uh, home, home vehicle charging systems. Uh, I'm not sure the technology is there for that. Um, in my opinion, none of these proposals are, uh, well, all of them have their weaknesses and not the least of which is that um, it conflicts with our desire to try to create incentives for electric vehicle adoption. Uh, and as, as I said, as far as I know, none of these proposals are really being addressed in New Jersey yet. Uh, we may well see something coming out of Washington in the new administration. And so I would just say, stay tuned. Let's see what, what happens here. Great, thank you. Um, Jim, anything you wanted to add? Cause then I'm gonna go on. I know a lot of people wanna hear about Gateway. So I'm gonna move on to that in a minute with you, but anything no, you wanna just, add to that? Just, you know, look, having served on the MTA board, chairing New Jersey Transit, uh, public agencies are not, they don't have the DNA to do what needs to be done to cut costs. It's just not going to happen because at the end of the day, you know, it's the politics gets in the way. I think I, I close by saying, look at the airline model. We haven't even begun, uh, any transit agencies in the country haven't even begun to look at reducing costs. That should have been done four or five months ago. We're going to go into another year and I guarantee you're not going to see any reduction in costs, any real meaningful reduction. But if you look at the airline model, private sector, what did they do? Well, they got money from the federal government. They kept our pilots on for a while. Then they did all those things already. They retired a bunch of older pilots. They parked the big planes. They went to smaller planes. They did a bunch of things to mitigate the losses that they have, which is still in the billions of dollars. It's, and it's, this is not the fault of the board at the, of, of any of these transit agencies. It's because of the way they're set up. I think now if, if they were privatized, and I'm not saying you can privatize everything overnight, you would have seen reductions, you would have seen the kind of imagination, the reimagination that's necessary because this is a crisis worse than the Great Depression. There's no demand, the demand's not gonna come back fast, but every day you've got, every month you've got hundreds of millions of dollars in payroll and expenses, it's just not gonna go away. So, you know, these bold steps need to be taken now or else we're gonna be here a year from now still talking about nipping at the seams. And in terms of raising more money, the turnpike, it is a cash cow, it has been. So there, and there has been cross subsidies and the turnpike tolls are really high and I'm not advocating for higher tolls, but you can always, the easiest thing you can do in the short run is toll 287 and 80. I think if, if, if anything that's simplistic and easy to do, it's being done in other places. You gotta get the federal government involved because you gotta, those are the easiest things to do. Everything else, including that is political, but the bottom line is you need more revenue, but you can't get enough revenue from all the things that Bob and everybody else talked about. We looked at it. You've got to cut costs. That's simply it because it's just the, the, the crisis is just too great. Sorry. That's my DNA. No. That's my business private sector DNA kicking in. It's just, no. you know, it's like, it's my money. You know, it's like, I could see the bleeding. It just doesn't end. You know? Yeah. That's, that's why we want to have a variety of perspectives. Yeah. I would just, I would just uh, echo what uh, Jim said about tolling that, um, at, at, as much as it will be difficult to put it in place, it makes a ton of sense. We have two, we have the Turnpike Authority is a great example of New Jersey of, of generating the revenue needed to maintain and expand that road to support the economy of New Jersey. Um, it's arbitrary that we only toll north-south roads in, in the state and not east-west and, and other facilities. Um, and I think that there's opportunities as well for, uh, you know, technology has provided us the opportunity to think about um, uh, uh, using uh, fees to, to shape people's behavior and the choices they make. And uh, I, I believe congestion pricing in New York will eventually be put in place, um, notwithstanding the, the current de delays based on, on COVID. And the idea of congestion pricing in other places in New Jersey, I think, uh, should be explored as well. Can I throw out an idea, Regina? Yeah, real quick, it's going to go to Gateway. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, just, you know, this was something that was uh, looked at in the legislature bef uh, just before I left, and that was the idea of, uh, of using impact fees. Um, you know, the, uh, people build these large um, apartment buildings in places like Jersey City and, and Hoboken. They have a very substantial impact on mass transit services. Um, probably uh, enhance the value of the, of the uh, real estate investment. 
and yet the uh, the developers really share nothing in the, the the costs that they impose on the system. The legislation is already in, in place authorizing impact fees in the municipal land use law. It needs some fine tuning, and it needs to be. Uh, uh, if we go this route, it needs to be. Uh, 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 there needs to be an objective formula, uh, but I think there's an opportunity to. Um, for developers to share the cost of the impacts that they Im impose on the community in terms of the mass transit system. It's something that I think deserves some exploration. Yeah, I think, we actually had a question about that, but uh, I would, I'm building on what Bob said, um, thinking about it beyond the impact of the initial development is really important as well, because there are ongoing needs for operating support. And, uh, you know, we wrote uh, the Boris Transportation Center work with uh, uh, Assemblyman DeCroach years ago uh, on uh, legislation to create special benefit districts, which are, would be similar, similarly organized so that, uh, that places that wanted dip, uh, additional transit service or benefited from transit service would be able to, to assess um, commercial and or residential properties, uh, a, a benefit fee that was associated with the service they're getting on a regular basis. Great, Thank, thanks for that. Thanks for all those ads. Okay, um, so we've got um, a variety of kinds of questions around Gateway and uh, Jim, we're gonna start with you. Um, so, and I'm gonna characterize it in this way. So there's been recent massive infrastructure projects in our region, a lot in New York, the Second Avenue subway, the Moynihan train hall, and we're starting work on the portal bridge, of course, as a first phase. Now, one part of the questions are with all the uncertainty, right, around not just work arrangements and as Nicole mentioned, you know, businesses willing to bring their employees back and insist that they come back and even new technology. Um, you know, when you really think about the changes, we talked about electric, but there's many more, you know, uh, innovation coming along. If you really think about all those things, number one, do we still think Gateway is the right way to pursue? And if the answer to that is yes, there's a couple questions about funding. Do we really know how to generate the funds associated with it? So Jim, we'll start with you about, you know, does it still make sense um, given all these changes and uncertainties that we've got and technology? Yeah, on a merit basis, it's the number one project in the country. It has to get done. These are, in the past, that we called them 100 year projects. They're now 150 year projects. The way you build the tunnel today compared to the way we did it, I think that tunnel was completed in 1905 or 1915, it's well over 100 years ago. As a matter of fact, it was built a couple of years before the Spanish flu and look what happened to the city afterwards. So by the time the tunnel is built, you know, with the pandemic in mind, the pandemic is gonna be a distant memory. We, before the pandemic, you could only get 26 uh, trains. I think it's 26 trains an hour going in in the AM peak, right? You've got several hundred thousand people a day from New Jersey alone. You've got the Amtrak numbers. And by the way, Amtrak, and, and it's, it, this, is the, this is the core where you would have high-speed rail. You cannot exist for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, the, the, the tunnel that we have now is 115 years old. There are life safety issues with that tunnel, which we don't like to talk about. And you can't repair it. You really cannot repair it unless you take it out. And even if you take out one tube, you, you reduce two thirds of the throughput. It's not half, you know, it's two thirds of the throughput mathematically. So if we started that tunnel tomorrow, which we're not ready for, I don't think there's a record of decision or, or anything like that. You're looking at 10 years from now. So that tunnel needs to happen because it's a 150 year project. And at the end of the day, c c cities always survive. I mean, you look at Paris, the Black Plague and you know, all sorts of cities, they all survive. I'm, I'm bullish on New York in the long run. Right now, things don't look good. But in the long run, everybody wants to be together. It's, it's, you know, it's a big tourism area. Cities will survive. And we have short memories in this country. The pandemic will fade and everybody's going to want to get back into the city. And we have to prepare ourselves for the next pandemic. With all the money that's being put out with these trillions of dollars and all the money that's wasted, um, this, the, 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 uh, the least phase one, which is the tunnel and the portal bridge is a drop in the bucket. It has to get done. It's, it's been the number one project since uh, I would join the FTA in 05. It's still the number one project in the country. And one thing I'd like to leave you with, the reason why I, I, I get on operating costs, because we take capital dollars, we put it into operating. A dollar saved on operating is a dollar for capital. 
So these amount to, if you were to cut the cost properly for these transit agencies, you could probably self-fund most of this tunnel. It's, you know, and I tell you right now, with the number of ridership that you have and the operating costs at these transit agencies, you could put everybody in an Uber every day. You wouldn't have to worry about spacing or anything else. You could put everybody in an Uber. The, the, the subsidy is so large right now because, uh, uh, because nobody's riding the, the transit system. So you need the gateway project. It has to happen. Okay, so I'm going to go to Nicole. I'm going to ask you to comment just from a New York perspective, and then Bob and John, if you want to add anything on. Go ahead, Nicole. Yeah, it's it's very trendy right now to say we can do with the Hudson Tunnel what Governor Cuomo did with the L train tunnel reconstruction, which is rather than shut the L train tunnel down, the governor uh, he. he uh, put a team of academics to rethink this and just racked all of the cables and the infrastructure on the inside of the tunnel rather than take away the bench walls where all of the existing infrastructure was, take those apart, uh, take the old infrastructure out and put new infrastructure in. That would have been a couple year project with no L train service and the governor maintained much of the L train service did this more quickly and cheaply just through racking the cables. But there's no, uh, there's, there's no certainty or even no evidence that the L train uh, tunnel, the way the governor did it, will actually work in the long term. The engineers who were hired to come study this, who were not from academia, came and testified before the MTA board, I guess it's going on two years ago now, and said, yeah, you can do it this way, but it probably won't last as long. You're gonna to have to come back in 20 years and do it again because all of this infrastructure is exposed now. You're not, you're not getting a 50, 60 year rebuild like you would if you took apart those bench walls. So do we want to do this the right way and have this be, as, as Jim said, you know, a multi-decade project that's actually finished or do we wanna do it the kind of stopgap way and have to come back and do it again in 20 years. Plus this tunnel is different than the L-Train tunnel. There's not a lot of clearance room to re-rack cables and infrastructure and still have the trains going through and still have room for people to exit in the case of a, a fire or another emergency. So I don't think we should be blithe. And of course, no one here is being blithe about saying, oh, well, this worked on the L train, we can just do this on, on the Hudson River Tunnel. And again, as Jim talked about, there are capacity issues. I mean, you can't, you cannot increase the number of trains going through one tunnel. So I think, yes, we do need another Hudson Tunnel. What we should think about doing a different way is, do we really need to build another Penn Station underneath Penn Station, which is the Penn South project, I think that's something we can we can think about doing a different way. Should we be through running these trains into Queens so that you go straight across from New Jersey to Queens, you're not using Penn Station as a hub. Again, that would be more of the European or the developed Asian model. And I think that's something we should be thinking about where we just have one regional commuter system spanning uh, Queens to New Jersey where you don't, you don't have a sort of... Uh, uh, a separation and a wall of Penn Station between the trains coming from New Jersey and the trains going out to the east. Okay, thank you, Nicole. Hey, Bob, could you talk about the funding a little bit? You know, how do you see, I mean, I'm assuming, you know, disagree or not with the need for it, but from a funding perspective, your your perspective on that. Funding for, for Gateway? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, don't have, um, you know, I'm not sure we, we, we need to make major alterations. I mean, the, the last time I checked, it's a heavy uh, federal component, I think half, and then the other half split between New York and New Jersey. And I, uh, forgive me, but I think Governor Cuomo's suggestions that this could be like the L train project may reflect the fact that he doesn't want to pay for it. Um, uh, I, I suspect that uh, we're going to see uh, an influx of, of federal money, perhaps um, more than the 50% coming out of the Biden administration. I have no inside information about that. Um, what, I, what I would like to just say is I just you know, totally agree that this project is, is essential. It's the choke point of the Northeast Corridor, accounts for 25% of GDP. Um, and if, if one of those tunnels goes down, 200,000 people, uh, at least at pre-pandemic levels, can't 
get get to, to work. Um, and um, you know, I I have taken a, a tour of those tunnels on the Amtrak observation train, the the glass enclosed train, where you can see all of the flaws in the in the the structure. And it, you know, it is it looks like it's 110 years old. And it is not like it's a totally different project than the L train project. Uh, to, to do the work required in the, the, the North Hudson tunnels, as they're called, we have to rip out track. And you can't do that overnight and then put it back in time for the, the, the commuting trains in the morning. It's just a totally different project. Um, it, 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 you know, we need two new tunnels. Okay, thanks. So John, I'm gonna to go to you, um, and then I'm also gonna ask you another question about development, but you know, um, can you speak to, from the perspective of the new technologies and new kind of as, you know, orientation around the transit hubs we're gonna get into, but anything to add on the gateway before we move to that? Uh, I, you know, I would just say that, that uh, we can't lose sight of the fact also that um, it's not just capacity um, that's important. Uh, the redundancy and resiliency in this quarter that doesn't exist today is uh, critical for tomorrow, especially as um, we're facing the challenges of, of climate change at the end of the century and things like that. So um, another argument uh, in favor of, of moving forward is that redundancy that, that we really do need into an honor of Manhattan. Um, you know, the, uh, I, I think the, the future of, um, of technology solutions in terms of automated vehicles and, and things like that uh, doesn't really change the equation that um, you still need to be able to get under the river to get into to Manhattan. So um, uh, I, I think there will be changes in technologies that, that uh, facilitate a shift in some cases to, to um, moving people in different types of, of vehicles and things like that. Um, but you still need the, the conduit pipe to get between New Jersey and New York. Um, so uh, that to me doesn't change the fundamental need for the, the tunnel, the physical tunnel itself. Um, you know, whether, whether technology over the next 25, 50 years changes a little bit to, to move us in one direction or another, um, uh, you know, is still going to require the ability to get from point A to point B. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, the technology question is, is interesting as well. Um, you know, uh, some people think that automated vehicles will shift people away from, from public transit and, and such, but um, there's also only so much tunnel and, and bridge capacity to get into and out of Manhattan. So, uh, you know, the congestion, the levels that exist today would not change if, um, if the technology shifted to automated vehicles. Um, so there's still going to be need to, to move people in, in mass amounts through uh, public transit vehicles. And um, therefore, the, that additional tunnel capacity will, will be needed, I think, 100 years from now as well. Okay, um, so I want to, um, you know, move a little bit to kind of the uh, development side now. Uh, Bob started to mention, or, or Jim, uh, Bob started to mention it. So from this perspective, we're going to start with John on this one. Um, you know, there's just been an awful lot of transit-oriented development um, when, uh, you know, benefit of having uh, access to Manhattan. Now, should that be reevaluated? Re you know, as some people really seem to be not as, uh, you know, copacetic with being in urban environments. And conversely, you know, how do you, we begin to prepare for um, what could be another suburban boom? And, and to add on to that, um, one of the questions that came in was really about uh, lifestyle, and others have mentioned this. People have gotten used to not only the not having to bear the commute, but also the cost savings, both in terms of my cost of going to work and coming back to work and the employers and you know, their cost of office space, et cetera, that they're now restructuring. You know, talk about all of this uh, development in that perspective, like why would people wanna give back those savings and what is, do you believe the attraction of urban versus more suburban now? Yeah, you know, I think, um... A couple things, uh, lots to unpack in, in that setup. But uh, first off, um, the, I think the scale of density that uh, is most associated with um, uh, transit-oriented development outside of the, the, the core of Manhattan um, is not the type of density that uh, that people are are as much afraid of from a pandemic perspective. Um, you know, I think the you know, Morristown and Rawway and you know, maybe Jersey City and Hoboken are a little bit like Manhattan, but they're still not the same uh, level of density, really. 
Uh, so I don't think that's an issue long term. I actually think that there may be um, uh, there may actually be more demand for transit oriented development moving forward um, because people will be traveling fewer days into and out of Manhattan most likely because of work from home. Um, they're still going to desire that proximity to transit and access to the, the region's core, but um, they're also going to, uh, I think, be attracted to places that are maybe a little bit more distant to give us an opportunity to, to kind of expand our notion of where transit-oriented development in, in, um, in New Jersey and in the, the northern suburbs of, of New York, um, you know, where that periphery and that circle is. Um, Richard Florida uh, spoke at an event I, I planned uh, earlier this year for New Jersey Transit, and, um, and he talked about the what he believes might be a, a kind of resurgence in the in the uh, uh, multi-core kind of landscape of um, of development in the area in New Jersey and, and other suburbs, so that um, there'd be a, a more of a multi-centric kind of land use pattern, and I think that's uh, you know, I think there is an opportunity for that, that to actually occur. Um, people desire to live in, um, in mixed use kind of urban places for more than just proximity to, to transit to get to New York, right? There is uh, the environments in many transit oriented developments are, are kind of 24 uh, seven, uh, 365 day a year communities where people have uh, many amenities and they're attracted to restaurants and entertainment opportunities and all, all those sorts of things, culture, et cetera. So I, I, I think the desire lines for those things post pandemic are still gonna be there, um, which argues in favor of, uh, of more mixed use kind of urban places at a scale that is more typical of the TODs that we, we think about outside of the urban core. Um, and I think that's gonna be part of our future. Okay. Um, comment um, maybe uh, Bob or Jim about, you know, this whole about the employer from the employer perspective. Um, do you think that there's going to be, you know, a change in, uh, or this will be a more permanent change because of the savings from both the individual and the employer? I think it's maybe too soon to tell. There's going to be some change, obviously. It's, it's nice not to have to, if you think about it, getting on the train or the bus or the car every day going to work. So, Will it change transit-oriented development? I don't think so. Long-term, will it change, let's call it the core Manhattan? I say no. I say at the end of the day, people want to be together. Cities survive over the long-term. So this is, uh, you know, this could be a five-year issue, uh, maybe hopefully less, but I, the resiliency is always, historically, cities always survive and people want to, especially younger people want to live in the, in the urban core. And I don't know if that's going to change. I agree with Jim. Okay, Nicole, anything else? Yeah, I think the big risk to Manhattan and kind of hyper dense hubs is that a lot of people will find they do want some level of density, they want some cultural offer offerings, they want to be able to walk to a restaurant and go out to eat and not have to worry about driving home, but that they don't need the level of density that Manhattan offers. So if you think about Hoboken, Jersey City, uh, if you go north, you think about New Rochelle, New Paltz, uh, places that have, you know, a contemporary art museum where they have one or two theaters that are kind of like, uh, you know, summer stock to off Broadway. For most people who are not theater mavens or culture mavens, that is good enough. And of course, you can still come into the city a few times a year if you want to see an opera or you want to go to the Met or, or one of the big hub museums. But I don't think New York can rely on the fact that people have to be within a certain radius of Manhattan anymore because they, they need to enjoy these uh, cultural offerings that are only available in the city. I think over the past 20 years, you know, as Jim mentioned at the outset, Richard Florida, a lot of cities have tried to emulate this uh, strategy of attracting the creative class over the past two decades. And they have succeeded in, in no small measure in beefing up their own cultural offerings, walkable amenities. So I think that will be real competitions in New York. Great, thank you. Okay, so I have, I have two quick questions or you know, questions want to get, just get some quick answers and uh, reactions to if we could. Um, so one, and this is from an audience member, um, will we see a COVID fee on travel like we saw after 
And if you think this will happen, um, what do you think will be packaged with? And maybe Bob, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, you know, I, I still maintain some uh, connection with my friends in the legislature. I've heard no discussion about that at all. I can't add much more. All right, Jim. I think people want to forget the word COVID, so I, I don't see that happening either. It's Okay, good. Uh, Nicola, John, anything? Yeah, I haven't heard any conversation about that either. No, I don't see anything called a COVID fee. I think the risk is if we don't address these transit operating and capital costs, we'll be trying to increase the already high price of these monthly commuter passes and the take up of commuter passes has plummeted. You know, most people are not buying their monthly pass because they're not commuting. If we go to two day or three day a week commuting, people will not be buying these monthly passes. So the idea that you're gonna pay, you know, 400, $500 for a monthly commuting pass, that is not going to work. I think these transit agencies are going to have to find a different way of, of trying to uh, address these budget gaps other than assume people have no choice but to pay a higher rate for the monthly pass because they, they do have a choice now. Yeah, well, building on that actually, and uh, we'll start again with Bob. Um, you know, what do you think the future schedules look like? I mean, do you see any changes in them? And if so, what kinds? Um, did you direct that to me? Yeah, to start, yeah. we're gonna ask everybody. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I still think it's a, a little early to tell. I will tell you that at, at Transit, uh, we've actually retained some consultants to look into uh, uh, the future and make some, um, make an analysis of, of of um, how uh, work patterns may, may change, what industries are gonna open and, and when. Uh, uh, but I, I think it's gonna take a few years really to, to see how this all shakes out. Uh, you know, I, I really do. Yeah, and you and I talked about before about uh, bus and train, they're two different, you know, animals yeah. to try to figure out, yeah. I think there'll be a, uh, I think the traditional um, three hour peak is probably gonna change a bit. Um, in the midterm, so short midterm and probably long term, um, with increased flexibility in terms of reporting to work and things like that. Um, I can, uh, and you know, I think uh, New Jersey Transit experimented with uh, you know, using technology to let people know crowded where where crowded buses are. Um, you know, that's a great innovation that could um, continue into the future that would allow people to make more informed choices about you know when they're jumping on a bus or jumping on a train which ultimately would be more efficient for um, the, the transit agencies and make the customer experience better. Um, all of that, I think, perhaps bodes well for, um, you know, for actually higher quality service in the longer term. And John, are you seeing anything in PATCO or any of the other agencies? Um, I, I haven't been as connected to PATCO, but um, I know that uh, Port Authority through the PATH services is really trying to think through a lot of this. Um, uh, the, the private sector um, bus companies who were hit incredibly hard with uh, the, the reduction in, in New York bound commutes um, are, are sort of rethinking, you know, what, what does our service look like um, post pandemic, uh, you know, whether that's a service pattern change or a change to express buses or the times of service, all that sort of stuff. I, you know, everybody is really kind of thinking about it, but like Jim said, it's going to take a it's going to take a while to have all of this sort of um, sort itself out. Uh, my guess is starting in the fall, uh, we'll start to see experimentation um, with you know what the post COVID normal new normal work uh, relationships might be. Uh, you know, I for one, as you know, Rutgers as a major employer, um, we're thinking through what that return looks like in September. With the assumption that that uh, uh, will be successful in in vaccinating a, you know, a significant portion of the population, um, but we're not thinking that it goes back to normal. That's for sure. Um, you know, even with the vaccinations, we're expecting that uh, you know social distancing and and things like that within the office will remain probably our our operating assumption for years to come, uh, because not everybody's going to get vaccinated. There's still the possibility of transmission. Vaccines are only 80%, 90% effective. Um, and, and all that will start to get sorted out, I think, starting in the fall. So we have another year, I think, of 
of really kind of uh, muddling through, and then we can start to uh, kind of uh, institutionalize some of the patterns that start to, to take hold. Okay, and Leslie and Nicole, anything from MTA or from that perspective to schedule? They had been threatening 40% service cuts before this latest round of federal aid came through in December. So they got another $4 billion in December. That will take them through 2021. For, so for the moment, they are doing a much reduced schedule on Metro North, Long Island Railroad. Other than that, haven't they haven't done formal cuts on the subways and most of the buses. What and of course the, the big exception to that is they've cut the overnight service. So there is no there is no subway service from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m., which they claim they are not doing for fiscal reasons. They claim it's because they they want to discourage homeless and mentally ill individuals from using the subways as an overnight shelter. I'm kind of skeptical of that. Uh, you could you you could uh, have aggressive outreach and take people out of the subway system while keeping the subway system open. I think it's in the long term, it is a bad signal to reviving New York to keep the subway closed in the overnight hours. If you want to rebuild nightlife, if you if you want to make New York interesting again for college students, for young people, you have to way have to have a way for restaurant workers, bar workers. To to get home at 2 a.m., 2.30 a.m., and to get to work at, at 4 and 5 a.m. in the morning. So I think that's the one big change that they've made that goes in, in the wrong direction. But other than that, the main constraints to running daytime subway service are just so many members of the crew being out sick or being in, in quarantine because other people have been out sick over the past uh, almost a year. Right, good. Okay. Well, I'm going to thank you, Nicole. Um, I'm going to try to wrap this up and, you know, give anyone an opportunity when I add anything to what you've already covered, uh, because I hope, you know, for everyone, what we try to do it in the Garden State Initiative is, you know, bring multiple perspectives and really try to, and this is one problem that definitely will be sorting itself out, as everyone, I think, has just said in the last couple of minutes over the next, you know, months to, um, you know, maybe uh, longer than that. And uh, the, sh the phasing back to whatever the uh, new construct will be, I think will be fascinating. And the more flexibility, I mean, in my, my interest and what I was listening for today was, you know, how do you build as much flexibility as we possibly can in how we do transportation planning? Because it's certainly going to be different and we don't know how, but I'm trying to stay ahead of that. So, um, you know, really appreciate everybody here today. Anything anybody wants to add in terms of um, final closing remark? I'd like to add one thing. Ahead, fair, uh, fair policy. We're not creative enough anywhere. There is demand for, let's call it Jersey Transit because I know that the best because of the time that I spent there. But we did away and I authorized it. When, as soon as we got there, one of the recommendations was to save money to do away with discounts. So we did away with, I don't know if it was weekend discounts, but we did discounts for families or something like that off peak. Then we tried to bring it back and had a lot of problem with staff. And then we ran out of time to get it done. But the fares have gotten so high, particularly commuter rail. I don't know what the buses are like, but just generally, you've got a whole class of economically disadvantaged people that really need transit to go to the doctors and things like that, but they can't afford to take it. So now with COVID and we're running trains, we have all this capacity. What about being creative and bringing back some things to spur demand for people that need transit dependent people? In many cases, in New Jersey and New York can't afford transit any longer. That's why you see fair, you know, the turnstile jumping and, and the like in New York. So now's the time we've got all this capacity to try things to try to spur a ridership. I kind of think that we really need to, if you've got all those consultants over there at Jersey Transit, let them work on fair policy because you can't just keep raising fares. Like right now we're gonna raise fares again, then more pe less people are gonna ride transit. It's just, you know, it's simple supply and demand. So I think fair policy really needs to be looked at, particularly with the economically disadvantaged in the state of New Jersey and also in New York. Good thank idea. You. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Jim. Uh, yeah, yeah, as you say, uh, you know, really thinking about the different, um, you know, sectors that use it. it's not just for work community, it's for everyday life as well. And thinking about that from a fair structure, I think is terrific. Um, John, anything you want to add at the end? Uh, no, you know, I think that uh, uh, you, your word 
choice of flexibility is going to be really, really important moving forward. And um, I think uh, agility will be key as well uh, in terms of decision making and uh, operations and things like that. Great. Okay. Well, with that, I will uh, close and thank again all of the panelists, Bob, Jim, uh, Nicole, and John. Really appreciate your insights. And if anybody has any questions, um, you know, on our website, you can always uh, ask a question or reach me directly. Uh, my contact information is on the website, and we really appreciate everybody's participation today and look forward. We'll be planning future forums on various subjects, and you'll be hearing more about that uh, as we announce them. So thank you.